Welcome back to the channel, Hobbywon Kenobi here. It's time to give the MI-24 a go. Known as the Hind, this helicopter has always fascinated me as a kid who grew up in the 80s. Name any action hero who went up against a Warsaw-packed country, fictitious or real, and the one helicopter sent out would be the MI-24 Hind gunship. Even the latest Top Gun featured one near the end of the film. After a bit of research, I opted to go with the Shvezda kits. I also decided to go with the V version. The Mi-24P is also offered by Shvezda, but this version carried a large cannon which simply didn't appeal to me. As a kid, I built the Monogram D version of this helicopter. That version of the Mi-24 and the V both served in the Soviet-Afghanistan War in the 80s, and it's this era which I wish to depict with this model. I plan to have the canopy doors open, so I decided to get the combined res kit resin and Quinta 3D decal cockpit set. After removing the pieces from their resin blocks and cleaning the pieces up, it's now time to start painting. I always use primer on resin parts, so I laid down a few light coats of Tamiya Gray primer and started to spray Tamiya Nato Black on the main pieces. Next, I wanted to create some chipping at the floor of the cockpit, just in front of the seats. Before going straight onto silver, I decided to weather the area first with a gray, implying worn but not quite yet chipped areas. I dry brushed artist oils to create this effect. While I was at it, I also applied the gray color with a sponge at areas where wear would make sense. I again used a sponge to apply the silver color for chipping. Next, it was time to start painting the few bits of color around the nearly all black cockpit. Now I started to highlight the seats, then started to color the seat cushions and straps. I used Vallejo color paints for these areas. Mixing the paints with just a bit of water on a wet palette has been a game changer for me when painting these kinds of details. I start to apply color in various patches, not being too concerned if the paint touches parts that shouldn't have the color. Touch up will happen soon. Since NATO black was used for the seats, a darker, truer black was used for the leather-like material found on the seat backs.
Once all of the details have been painted in the cockpit, I decided to add a straight black pin wash to rivets and other details. Now it's time to add the Quinta 3D decals. 3D decals are easy to apply, just remember a few things. First, place a drop of water on the backing paper. Placing the decals in the water isn't actually necessary and the decals will start to soak up the water and expand. You just need enough water to soften the backing paper and free the decal. Use PVA white glue to adhere the decals to the part. 3D decals can also be attached with super glue. Just use it sparingly and carefully. With most of the cockpit done, it's time to get the fuselage halves ready to receive both the engine and cabin. First I begin by filling the pin marks. For this I like to use CA glue and some accelerator like Zip Kicker. Then I use sanding sticks to level them off. I now attach the engine access hatches since I decided not to show the engine on this model. 
though I have to say that the details provided for the kit do make a nice representation of the engine. The interior of the cabin has been painted with a mixture of Tamiya paints, and after receiving a few coats of Mission Models gloss, it is ready for a dark oil wash. are allowed to dry, then removed with a Q-tip and an old soft brush, leaving a small percentage of the oils left in the crevices to depict shadows. Do be careful to allow the rotor engine to lean slightly to the starboard side of the helicopter. The rotor on this vehicle should lean about two degrees to the right. Once the wash was removed, the parts received a few coats of clear flat and the sub-assemblies were placed on one fuselage half. Once all of the sub-assemblies are in place, it's time to close the two halves. I applied thin CA with a glue looper to allow the product to run along the seam. I also ran some Tamiya Extra Thin in the hopes that if the CA didn't reach every spot, the Extra Thin would take care of it. At this point, it became apparent that the detail work in the cabin, including some carefully scratch-built seatbelts for the crew, would in fact not be visible, even through the eight windows. Next, I decided to fill a few seams around the fuselage. These were filled with Vallejo plastic putty. A toothpick was used to get the putty into the seam. The excess was quickly and easily removed with a moistened Q-tip. Once the fuselage halves were together, I started to add clamps on access panels, reshaped the nose, and used an X-Acto knife to drill out holes for the nose gun. Next, I purchased some sets of rivet decals from Quinta, Mike Grant, and Archer. The Quinta rivets were my favorite. They slid off the backing paper with ease and laid down nicely. A little decal setting solution was used to get them to adhere to the surface. The Archer decals required an extra step using Mr. Color Thinner to remove a layer of film. This didn't really bother me, but I did notice that I had to brush extremely gently, otherwise the rivets would start to come off one at a time. The Mike Grant decals were good, however, they were really panels that had rivets punched into them, making them appropriate really for only specific panels. I got a few of these sets, and I look forward to using them again on future builds when needed.
Next, it was time to apply pre-cut masks from ResKit. I love sets like these because they also offer masks for the inside of the clear parts, not just the outside. I am a big fan of painting the inside color of canopies, so this makes my work go much faster. These fit beautifully, and given the many curves of this two-seater bubble canopy, they were worth every penny of the $10 I spent on them. Before adding the canopy to the model, I needed to add a few more details to the cockpit. Thin CA glue was used to glue the canopy to the mop. I find that once the clear plastic is masked, CA hazing doesn't actually occur. Once the full model was well masked, I found I wanted to still scratch build the grab handles found near the roof of the helicopter. These were made by clipping a small piece of plastic rod. Then, using pliers, I smashed the ends to create the correct shape of the attachment points. Tamiya Extra Thin was used to meld pieces to the model. Finally, the model received coats of Tamiya Gray Primer. With the model primed, I applied a sand color I mixed with Tamiya paints. Next, I airbrushed a brown camo color. I neglected to get video of this process, but I used Elmer's tack and stick to create the sharper edges of the camo. The brown color is, again, a mixture of Tamiya paints. A word about the camo. I wanted to represent a helicopter involved in the Russian-Afghan war in the 1980s. I also wanted to do a sand and brown version of the Mi-24. After doing much research and scouring my five books on this vehicle, I came up with only a few black and white photos of it. I took a best guess as to the actual shades of these colors, and I am happy with the end result. Next, I used Tamiya tape and 3x5 cards to mask the lower portion of the light gray color on the underside. Removing the masking is always a highlight of model building. I love seeing how the paint turned out, and if I achieved an even line. Masking was removed from the body and the wings, which I left off until later in the build. The model then received coats of Mission Models gloss in preparation for the decals and later for the oil wash. The Shvezda decals laid down nicely and I was able to avoid any silvering. In the process of adding decals, I realized that the yellow triangles found at the tip of the tail would not actually perform well, so I opted to mask and airbrush the yellow. I would also need to mask and airbrush the distinctive arrows. Unfortunately, as I was removing the tape, I managed to place a piece directly onto one of the text decals, which says dangerous in Russian. Luckily, the Shvezda decals provided two versions of these warning signs, albeit in different fonts. Once the decals were dry, I airbrushed more gloss directly over the decals to protect them during the oil wash process. The oil wash was achieved using Windsor & Newton black and white, mixed to create a very dark gray. 
Turpenoid was used to thin the material, and I applied it liberally around all seams and crevices. After it dried, the excess wash was removed with Q-tips and a soft brush. Rather than start removing oil wash from the seams directly, I like to remove the material from the center of each panel, then work my way out. This way the wash closest to the edges can be manipulated with more care. After the wash was removed, a flat coat was applied. Next, I removed the liquid mask from the wing joints and glued the wings into their proper areas. Touch-ups were done at the joints by again using Elmer's tack and stick putty and airbrushing very lightly.
now it's time to work on the rotors. I spent a lot of effort removing the seam lines and all of the nooks and crannies. There was also a little flash around some of the small parts, so it's worthwhile preparing these pieces. After painting several details, I masked off the center of the main rotor in preparation for airbrushing the blades. My references showed that the blades on the top were a forest green color, and the bottom was a flat black. A lot of Tamiya tape and Blue Painter's tape was used to achieve the silver strip along the edge of the blades. However, one strip was offset because the tape was placed in the wrong position. This was easily fixed. After painting was finished, the rotor received a gloss coat in preparation for decals and the oil wash. Do remember that decals need to receive another coat on top of them, otherwise they will soak up the wash, which cannot be removed. The wash was made with Windsor & Newton Artist Oils, thinned with Turpenoid. Once dried, the wash was removed with Q-tips and paper towels. The parts were finished with a coat of clear flat. Next, it was time to remove the masking tape from the cockpit interior and canopy. I decided to use colored micro pens to add heat discoloration to the engine exhaust. Red and blue are blended into the silver color and add a nice touch of realism. Next, it was time to touch up the seams that didn't hold the wash really well. This is done with the artist oils, but over a flat surface so the lines stay. A thin brush is used to draw the line, and a flat brush is used to pull the oil paint away from the thicker lines. Any lines that aren't straight or are too prominent can be worked back with oil paints during the highlighting and weathering portion. Highlighting certain areas of panels can add texture to an otherwise monotone paint scheme. This is achieved by using white and black and even mixing the two to create an array of grays.
Modelers will sometimes call this process oil rendering. Paint can also be splattered by pressing a brush loaded up with heavily thinned artist oils and flicked across a toothpick. The splattering can be left to depict oil splatters or can be blended with a soft brush to again create variations in the surface. Finally, I decided to scratch build two windshield wipers that most closely resemble those seen on my references. These were made from various shapes of plastic. I also decided that this particular helicopter would look strange without the typical UB-32A rocket launchers, which were not actually provided in this kit. With these installed, the model was now complete. Overall, this kit was fun, though the lack of rivets became a major issue, and for that reason, I would try another kit manufacturer if I were to build this helicopter again. Well, that does it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this content, please leave a like, please subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.